Hey everybody, so today I'm going to be giving an example lecture um, that I'll provide to a class asynchronously um, about vertebrate ecology and the lecture today is going to be about thermal regulation in vertebrates. So some key concepts that we're going to cover is that temperature is a key environmental variable that limits ranges and distributions of vertebrates. Vertebrates maintain their thermal balance uh, with their environment via radiation, convection, conduction, and evaporation, and you can see some of those various factors um, on the, the figures around the screen there, um, such as thermal windows, basking, and we have the frozen frog down there, which we're going to get to in just a minute. Um, and body temperatures of most vertebrates vary with the environment. However, birds and mammals remain fairly constant. So continuing key concepts, we're going to talk about ectothermic and endothermic animals. And ectothermic organisms depend on the heat of the environment to maintain their body temperatures, whereas endothermic organisms maintain their uh, heat through metabolic heat production. And then organisms have evolved various means of adapting to stresses of heat and cold, such as um, behavioral processes, as you can see on the right. And then optimal temperatures for life processes influence the distribution in or of organisms. So let's start with a case study about frozen frogs. So cryonics is the preservation of bodies by freezing. And uh, the idea here is that in, uh, we can do this in hopes that we can bring back um, the, these, uh, these organisms to life sometime in the future. And there are, in fact, people, humans, that, that have been frozen um, in hopes that they can later be back, brought back to life. Sounds a little far-fetched, I know, but we do know that there are two species of uh, frogs that can do this, and they can survive the harsh Arctic tundra winters. Uh, and basically, they do this by maintaining a semi-frozen semi state, and they have no heartbeat, no blood circulation, and no breathing. There are only a few vertebrate species that can withstand freezing, and most of these, or most organisms, when they freeze, it results in tissue damage due to ice crystals perforating the cell membranes and organelles and essentially ripping the cells apart, turning the organism into a sort of a state of mush. So the question, of course, is how do the frogs survive being frozen? And we're going to revisit this idea later um, towards the end of the, the lecture today. So I'm going to give you a few seconds to think about this and think about it in terms of what um, physiological adaptations they may have, what behavioral adaptations they may have, et cetera. All right, as I said, we'll revisit this uh, at the end of the, the, the lecture. So variation in temperature. Temperatures vary um, greatly, or they can vary greatly in both space and time, and vertebrates have to adapt to these ranges in order to survive. So you can see, for example, in Glacier National Park, um, in the figure on the top here, we have the months of the year on the uh, x-axis and temperatures on the y-axis. And you can see that the temperatures range quite a bit um, during the across the year. So low temperature of uh, 9 Fahrenheit um, in, the, in January up to about 46, 47 degrees Fahrenheit in the uh, summer for the low. And you can see that the uh, range for high summer temperatures and high winter temperatures are also variable similarly. So across time, they're different. The same can be true for um, the Everglades. And you can see that the temperature differences in, um, in Glacier and the Everglades are also quite different. So the, the low temperature in January for the Everglades is about 56 degrees, whereas it was 9 degrees in um, Glacier. A um, couple of other terms that we want to uh, visit here, and this is um, dealing with animals or, or vertebrates responding to environmental variation. Those terms are acclimatization and adaptation. So acclimatization is an organism's ability to, um, to adjust to stress through behavioral or physiological means. It is a short-term and reversible process. And as an example, you can think about acclimatization to higher elevations involving higher breathing rates, greater production of red blood cells, and higher pulmonary blood pressure. And this is the reason that a lot of endurance athletes, uh, elite endurance athletes, train at high altitudes in order to, um, to have these acclimatization um, uh, occur in their body so that when they return to lower elevations, they can take advantage of the greater um, uh, oxygen saturation in their blood. And then adaptation. So over time, and that, this is a natural selection process that that uh, is a response of a population to an environmental stress. And individuals with traits that enable them to cope with the stress are favored. So over time, these genetic traits become more frequent in the population driving evolution. And adaptation is a long-term genetic response of the population. 
So quick look at the uh, range of, of organismal, um, the thermal ranges of organisms. And so at the very top, the very um, most warm environments that organisms can survive, um, those organisms are archaea and bacteria, and they tend to be in hot springs and thermal vents um, ranging just greater than 90 degrees Celsius or 195 degrees Fahrenheit, so just shy of boiling. And then the um, upper thermal limits of vertebrates is, tends to be about 47 degrees Celsius, whereas their lower um, thermal limit is about negative 6 degrees Celsius. And you can see sort of this area here where vertebrates tend to operate. So organisms or vertebrates must maintain a thermal balance, and vertebrates um, do this. They, they have to main, uh, balance energy lost and gained. And so we have to think about where does energy come from? and how is energy transferred. So the sources of energy, or where does energy come from? We're gonna start with radiation, and radiation is a major source of heat transfer. So you can think that, um, or there is about 1.4 calories per centimeter square per minute at noon on a clear summer day. And then um, skylight or diffuse radiation is about, uh, is, a, is a small portion of that. So it's about 2 kilo, 0.2, kilo, or 0.2 calories uh, per centimeter squared per minute whereas reflected light is about 0.1 to 0.3 calories per centimeter squared per minute, and then heat from metabolism. And uh, metabolic oxidation produce uh, one mole of glucose gives off about 686 kilocalories of energy, but only 40 cal kilocalories of this is trapped as uh, ATP, and the rest is lost as heat. So you can see that there's a lot of energy that is produced through metabolic heat production and so um, vertebrates have the ability to generate, some vertebrates have the ability to generate their own heat and, um, and stay warm uh, by metabolic heat production. Moving on is conduction. So um, this is the direct exchange of heat between one substance and another, and it depends on the surface area exposed. So some vertebrates have the ability to actually spread their bodies out um, and, and soak up more of the, the sun's ray or the, the, the um, sorry, the, and, um, conductive heat from, from large surfaces, surfaces that are warm, such as rocks, and you see snakes a lot of times um, warm themselves on, on dark surfaces, the reason a lot of them get squished in roads. Um, so temperature differences between the two surfaces are important for conduction. And then you can also think about thickness of insulation, fur feathers, that will keep organisms from getting uh, gaining or losing uh, too much heat. Convection is the transfer of heat by circulation uh, of fluid, and that can be liquid or gas. And this circulating around an animal's body um, and dissipating the heat. So you can think about um, countercurrent heat exchangers that we'll talk about later, and also these large thermal windows that some animals have, such as this small desert rat, um, where it has these really giant ears to create a, uh, a large surface area to uh, get rid of extra heat. And then evaporation, um, and this is um, the organism becomes cooled by changing liquid into its vaporous state and water um, therefore absorbing a lot of the, the heat that um, in the heat of vaporization uh, process. And this can happen through sweating or through uh, panting. So vertebrates can be grouped based on the nature of their body temperature variation. You think about poikilothermic, homeothermic, and heterothermic organisms. Those are three terms key to our discussion here. And um, poikilothermic organisms are those whose body temperature fluctuates with the external environment. And you can think about amphibians, fish, and reptiles. Whereas homeothermic uh, vertebrates are those whose body temperatures are relatively constant regardless of the external temperatures. And you think typically about birds and mammals. And then heterothermic um, organisms are those who sometimes regulate their body temperature and other times do not. So these three terms are really about um, the nature of body temperature variation. Okay, and then uh, vertebrates can also be grouped based on how they thermoregulate. So we have two terms uh, uh, related to this, and that's endothermy and ectothermy, or endothermic organisms and ectothermic organisms. And ectothermic vertebrates are those whose body temperature is maintained by oxidative metabolic heat production. And again, we think typically about mammals and birds, whereas ectothermic vertebrates are those whose body temperature is maintained by external sources of energy, so solar radiation and not metabolism. Uh, again, think about fish, reptiles, and amphibians. And if we take a look at this for the picture, you can see that uh, thermoregulation is really quite variable. And uh, again, we have these three terms, poikilothermic, homeothermic, and heterothermic. 
and these relate to body temperature variation, whereas ectothermic and endothermic relate to body temperature regulation. So um, organisms that are poikilothermic tend to be fish, amphibians, and reptiles, whereas those that are homeothermic are birds and mammals. However, sometimes mammals can be heterothermic, uh, or some mammals are heterothermic. We also think about fish, amphibians, and reptiles being ectothermic, and mammals and birds being endothermic. However, there are instances where fish and uh, reptiles are heterothermic and uh, mammals can be poikilothermic. So we look at this a little different way. You can have an endothermic homeotherm, so such as this uh, cute little puppy here, uh, you, where he maintains his own temperature um, and the temperature is quite, uh, quite constant. And then an ectotherm, so they don't maintain their own temperature. However, the temperature remains, is uh, relatively constant because they are in water and the water remains a relatively constant temperature. And then we have uh, endotherms that are porkilothermic, so they have the ability to maintain their own body temperature, but they go into some state of torpor where they uh, allow their body temperature to fluctuate with the external environment. And then, of course, there are ectotherms that are also porkilothermic. And those are, um, think about frogs and reptiles whose body temperature typically fluctuates quite widely, widely with the external temperature. Um, so we take a quick look at the effects of temperature on poikilothermic metabolism. And we're gonna talk about Hopf's reaction rate or temperature rule. And the temperature coefficient or Q10 is, the, um, is what we're talking about here. And this, in, with the temperature coefficient metabolism or the rate of oxygen consumption doubles with every 10 degrees Celsius rise in temperature. So the equation that we use is the Q10 or temperature coefficient is equal to the rate of metabolism at a given temperature divided by the rate of metabolism at a temperature at that temperature, the initial temperature minus 10 degrees. And um, for most fish, the body temperature is equal to the water temperature, so the Q10 is sort of simplified. And uh, generally, for many species, the temperature coefficient Q10 relationships approach 2.0. For every, in other words, for every 10 degrees Celsius in temperature uh, increase, there is a metabolic uh, doubling, metabolic rate doubles. And with uh, however, within a species, the Q10 may vary over different ranges of temperatures. In other words, it's not a linear response. And so you can see in the figure on the right here, we have uh, the orange are goldfish and the red are brook trout. And so you can see temperature on the x-axis and uh, metabolism on the y-axis. And so um, I'll give you a couple of minutes to think about this or look at this, but you can see, at, let's look at 10 degrees and 20 degrees. And just to give you um, uh, an idea here, at 10 degrees, the uh, metabolic rate is about 0.6 for goldfish, whereas at 20 degrees, the metabolic rate is about 0.24. And for uh, brook trout, the metabolic rate at 10 degrees is about 1.5, whereas at 20, the metabolic rate is close to 3. So I'll give you a minute to think about that and uh, evaluate what the uh, Q10 would be for each of these species. All right, I don't want to give you too much time here, so let's move on. So what would the relationship uh, or the Q10 relationship be for brook trout and goldfish when we move from, 20 to, from 10 to 20 degrees? So for brook trout, our initial temperature, um, uh, or our initial, um, initial metabolism, rate of metabolism at 10, at 10 degrees is 0.15, whereas at 20 degrees is 0.29. So the Q10 is equal to 1.93 or pretty close to two. However, for goldfish, our initial um, metabolic rate at temperature of 10 degrees was 0 0.06, whereas at 20 degrees it was 0.24, and the Q10 is about four, so much greater for a goldfish than it was for, um, for brook trout. The other thing I think you could take a look at is if what if we considered, say, like 12 degrees um, as, as opposed to 10 and 22 degrees, and you can see that the, the relationship, not uh, because it's not linear, in other words, the uh, brook trout rate increases at a, a somewhat of an exponential increase, you can see that it would uh, change more dramatically than that of the brook trout, but the brook trout also have that curvilinear response. So those two things would change. You can sort of play with that figure a little bit if you'd like.
So acclimation affects thermal limits. And so for example, uh, brook trout that are acclimated to 22 degrees Celsius, in other words, they are um, slowly brought up to 22 degrees Celsius and held at 22 degrees Celsius, can um, tolerate being immersed in 26 degree water for some period of time where usually 23 degrees Celsius is lethal to them. However, if they're acclimated to 18 degrees Celsius and exposed or immersed in 26 degrees Celsius, they immediately lose their equilibrium and die. Um, alternatively, fish can usually handle temperature drops um, more effectively. So as an example, brown bullheads that are shocked from 25 degrees Celsius to four degrees Celsius lay on the bottom, their eyes dilate and fish become motionless, but they don't die. So back to porkelotherms, um, some advantages and disadvantages. Porkelotherms allocate uh, more energy than um, than endotherms to, um, to biomass and to metabolic processes, maintaining thermal homeostasis. Um, they are tolerant of extreme environmental conditions. Their temperature extremes, um, you can think about temperature extremes, drought and food shortages. Their activity is restricted to the, quote, warm periods of spring, summer, and fall. So they're sort of um, uh, have to become um, uh, torpor, they have to go through a state of torpor during the winter or um, become immobile during the, the winter at least unless there is a, a warm winter day. And then this results in reptiles tending to be sit and wait predators, for example. Um, this is because lactic acid must be reduced via aerobic respiration, which is a process that is tem temperature limited um, because of the um, activation, um, the, the rate of um, the rate of activation energy associated with with uh, aerobic respiration. And then terrestrial porculotherms being less able to be active in early morning and cool evenings or generally cool days. And this is um, results in a lot of venomous snake bites happening during these cooler periods of the day or cool days generally because the snake can't get away. Um, uh, onto homeotherms, Therm they have a thermal optimal that is maintained by metabolic processes. They can remain active at a range of temperatures. Of course, there are energy costs associated with that. And you can see in the figure on the right here that the uh, temperature is, uh, is located on the x-axis where metabolic rate is, in is shown on the y-axis. And the thermoneutral zone is this area here where temperature changes quite a bit, but there is no um, additional cost to the organism to maintain its thermal uh, balance. But once you get to a critical lower temperature, the metabolic costs start to increase. And so you can see as the temperature increases or decreases um, more dramatically towards the um, edge of this figure, you can see that organisms have to do something to maintain their thermal balance. And uh, a lot of times this will be, for example, shivering. Um, and then the other extreme at the higher temperatures are um, things that organisms will do, such as sweating or panning, um, or behavioral responses of getting out of um, out of the the sun and um, into some shaded areas. Uh, they also have the ability to regulate uh, the gradient between their body and air temperature, and they can do this with seasonal changes in insulation, uh, use evaporative cooling, thermal windows, or those large ears of some um, mammals, for example. They alter metabolic heat production. Um, and so, for example, activity levels um, and shivering. So they may reduce their activity in warm, um, warm times where they cross that upper critical uh, temperature, and then they may shiver at that lower critical temperature to maintain that um, their metabolic uh, or their their heat balance. Um, they also must store energy reserves um, during states of tor or bleeding up to states of tor torpor so that they can survive those winter conditions. Um, and then homeotherms, uh, homeothermy is size constrained. There is a relationship between body size and resting metabolic rate. And generally, weight specific metabolism is proportional to body mass raised to the 0.75 power. And so you can see that some of the smallest organisms um, uh, are vertebrates, shrews, versus uh, some of the largest land vertebrates, an elephant or a horse. And you can see that the resting metabolic rate for an elephant is much less than that of a shrew and this is per unit body mass. And um, this is the reason that uh, shrews, for example, have to be really voracious predators because they need to constantly eat to maintain that high metabolic rate so that they can thermoregulate. 
So why do homeothermic endotherms have lower specific metabolic rates? And this really comes down to the surface area to volume ratio being reduced as animals get larger. So smaller animals must have greater metabolic activity to maintain their inter internal temperature. Uh, five grams tends to be about as small as an endotherm can be. And uh, good examples of small organisms that are around that are even less. Uh, the pygmy shrew is about two grams. The golden crown kinglet is about 5.3 grams. And the ruby throated hummingbird is about 3.1 grams. And so you can see in the figure on the right here that we have a um, square or a cube, sorry, a cube with um, a side that is one equal to one, that could be centimeters, inches, whatever, versus one that is five. And you see that the total surface area for the, um, the cube that is one is six. The cube that is uh, five is 150. The total volume is one. The total volume for the cube for, that is, uh, has a side of five is 125. But this is where uh, we're really interested. So the surface to volume ratio surface area to volume ratio is much greater for the smaller cube than it is for the larger cube. So the um, larger cube reduces its surface area to volume ratio, meaning that it doesn't have as much surface area to lose heat. And this leads to a couple of rules, uh, ecological rules. One is Bergman's rule, and this uh, basically states that uh, as you move towards the poles, body size tends to increase, and that's the reason that, for example, polar bears are much larger than other bears. And then also Allen's rule. And in Allen's rule, there are, um, it states basically that uh, limbs, as you move towards the poles, become shorter and shorter. So you can see this, um, this hair here, snowshoe hair, has a much smaller, much smaller ears, much shorter limbs than the, um, the jackrabbit over here. And you can tell that they have, these, these large ears allow for um, countercurrent heat exchangers and thermal windows to exist and so they can get rid of extra, extra heat. So other means of dealing with temperature extremes, countercurrent heat exchangers, and this is um, when we think about mammal limbs, bird legs, and beaver tails, which allow them to, um, to maintain high, higher heat in their body. And so as an example, you see on the right in the upper part of this panel, there is a limb without a countercurrent heat exchanger. In other words, the vessels are not close together. And in the lower portion, the vessels are close together. The artery is close to the, um, the vein. And so when we don't have a countercurrent heat exchanger, the blood leaving the body along this limb is at 37 degrees um, here, 37 degrees. Celsius, as it moves further out towards the limb, it reduces its heat. But because it is farther, um, these two vessels are farther away from one another, it just continues to lose heat as it continues back towards the, the body, eventually getting to 16 degrees um, Celsius. Whereas the uh, countercurrent heat exchanger, because it's in close proximity to, um, the, the two vessels are in close proximity to one another, starts at 37, just as it does in the upper panel. As it moves along, it gets lower as, um, moving towards the limb than it did in the upper panel and is quite a bit lower at the end of the or the pads of the um, the paw here but as you start moving back towards the body the heat um, from the the um, artery is transferred to the vein and so you can see that we have an increased um, temperature that whereas in the upper panel it was 18 degrees celsius at this point in the lower panel is 28 and then where it was 16 degrees in the upper panel, sorry, 16 degrees in the upper panel is 36 degrees in the lower um, uh, panel. And then also reed or heat or reed heat exchanger. And this is used to cool off the brain of African antelopes, the oryx, um, during high daytime temperatures. So they have this, um, uh, this uh, reed located in their nasal cavity that circulates blood across their brain. And so there is uh, blood brought down into this area and as they breathe out, there's evaporative cooling um, that takes place and cause, so it helps keep their, their brain cool. So how do homeotherms deal with heat? Um, they use various means. We've talked about some of these already. They can use evaporative cooling, thermal windows, such as large uh, ears in desert mammals. They can seek shade or underground burrows. They can become nocturnal and they can change thickness of insulating layers. And typically, um, dealing with heat is a, is a more difficult task than dealing with cold environments.
So what about heterotherms? And heterotherms, remember that these are um, uh, poikilothermic or homeothermic species that sometimes regulate and sometimes do not regulate their body temperature. So some examples, uh, tuna, they use countercurrent heat exchangers to increase their muscle temperatures to above the ambient water temperatures so that they can perform better in uh, colder waters, uh, chasing uh, uh, after prey. And then in warmer waters, because the, uh, the warmer temperatures, they don't have to do this. They're already at a warmer temperature. And hummingbirds, um, they may have periods of the day with very low metabolism and inactivity to reduce metabolic costs and enter a state of torpor. And, uh, and then bears, bears of course can become uh, inactive or sleep for six months, uh, living off fat reserves. And when they do this, their heartbeat drops from about 40 to 50 beats per minute when they're active to eight to 10 bit beats per minute during a state of torpor. And their mat metabolism is about 50% of their normal metabolic rate. And then groundhogs uh, enter a true hibernation where they drastically reduce their body temperature to less than 10 degrees Celsius. Their heartbeat and respiration also drastically are reduced. So let's go back to our frozen frogs. So there are three problems that have to be overcome for an organism to withstand freezing. Uh, one is the freezing water forms needle-like ice crystals that can pierce cell membranes and organelles, sort of ripping the, part, the cells apart. Another is that when the ice forms, it actually pulls water out of the cells. And then lastly, is that oxygen supply is restricted due to the lack of breathing and circulation. So in animals that can withstand freezing, the freezing water is limited to the space outside the cells. In ice nucleation pro uh, proteins outside of cells serves as sites of slow controlled ice formation, which brings up a sort of an aside that is interesting. Um, our pure water actually freezes at negative 40 degrees, and that's where the Fahrenheit and Celsius scales cross, so uh, negative 40 Celsius or Fahrenheit. And typically, uh, ice forms at a much, much um, higher temperature than that because there are ice nucleation sites that form, um, that allow ice crystals to form. So um, these ice nucleation sites actually allow the water to freeze outside the cells as opposed to in the cells and sort of controls that process. And then additional solutes such as gl uh, glucose and glycerol are made inside the cells that lower the freezing point of the cells. And they um, basically act as sort of an antifreeze. So as a follow-up assignment um, to this lecture, you're gonna have a quiz on thermoregulation in vertebrates, and then you'll have a discussion space um, that's based on a couple of things. One is I want you to read uh, a chapter out of Bern Heinrich's Winter World, which is pictured on your right, um, called Hibernating Birds. And as you read, I want you to think about the material we covered in this presentation. Um, and for example, what adapta adaptations do the birds in the book chapter um, use to overcome harsh winter conditions? And then I want you to summarize the reading using the terminology and concepts that we covered in the lecture. And then the second part of the discussion is I want that you to uh, do some reading on your own about a vertebrate that can survive harsh thermal conditions and in the discussion space, describe the organism and their response to those harsh thermal conditions, and be sure to use the terminology and concepts that we covered here in the lecture as well. Uh, so that's it, and I look forward to seeing you guys again here soon.